right now. Are we ready? I'm ready. All right. <laughs> All right. Rev your brains up and uh, let's get started. Here we go with our first question. Take it away, Glenn. All right. First question. The European settlers who arrived at Plymouth in 1620 were of this religious sect. Were they pilgrims, Puritans, separatists, or Catholics? Uh, all right, we've already got some answers in already. You, it's we a good do time have for a... me to mention that you have 30 seconds to answer <laughs> each question. Right, yes, right? you have this 30 is... seconds. And we're going to use the honor system, no Googling, folks. Yeah. <laughs> ah, Libba, we got him with our trick question. It uh -huh. looks like one person did correctly guess separatist, but most folks picked Puritans. Ah, now, now, why is that, Glenn? Well, I'm so glad you asked, Libba. <laughs> uh, we think of Puritans as being what the pilgrims were. The pilgrims are simply what they were called because they came to the New World. The Puritans were a sect within the Church of England who wanted to reform the church itself. However, those who came to Plymouth in 1620 were technically separatists. The reason they were being so persecuted and therefore the reason that they left the shores of Old Blighty is because they wanted to totally separate themselves from the body of the Church of England. Indeed, indeed. And if we go to our scoreboard, it looks like Caver is in the lead. That's right. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Well done, Caver. <laughs> well done. <laughs> All right, we are going to go to our next question. Or I, I think we, we have a, a slide. Yes, this is another image or depiction of the. Uh, that's right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so here we have another depiction of uh, the separatists. All right, are we ready for our next question? Here we go. The Mayflower landed here first before arriving at Plymouth. Was it Nantucket Island, Dukes Island, Cape Cod, or Gull Island? We've got three quick answers in. Let's see, we got five now, six, all right. Ah, oh, we got, we got you with that one, uh, uh, most of you. It was indeed Cape Cod. It was indeed. Um, so let's see how that affected the scores. Oh, oh, well, all right, Caver's still in the lead, but History Josh is close behind, followed by Peter. <laughs> but it's still anyone's game. That's right, because we've got a lot of questions to go. How many do we have, Libba? 72 questions? Oh, we've got at least 400. At least 400. <laughs> Just kidding. So, <laughs> that's right, we don't have that many folks. Uh, Cape Cod is an area there in what becomes Massachusetts, but it is not Massachusetts, Massachusetts yet. It is called that because of the fish cod. There were such rich fishing grounds there, and... Later on, that would become a point of contention between the different European uh, powers coming to this area. But England got the first call mostly because of the establishment and permanence of the Plymouth colony. Uh -huh. All right. So we had Cape Cod next up. Let's see. Oh, true or false? The separatists found a thriving Native American village when they arrived at Plymouth. True or false? All right, now, true or false questions, you only have 20 seconds to answer. So it looks like most of our, ah, there we go. Oh, <laughs> we ah. got you with that one. Yes, yes. <laughs> Glenn, uh, let's, uh, well, actually, let's see um, who got that first on our scoreboard. Ooh, Caver has a streak of three answers in a row. Excellent. He's and on fire. Yes, on fire. But followed by history, Josh, and not too far behind is DD Want Chicken. <laughs> Maybe it should be DD Want Turkey, though. <laughs> right, yes, that's, that's, that's a good point. <laughs> All right, so uh, Glenn's going to give us a little more uh, information about that. Go right ahead. Right, so the, the village that was there, uh, the structures and the outline of the village existed, but it was absolutely deserted because... Previous contact with the Europeans had brought about disease, which was, of course, the, the deadliest thing that could affect Native Americans. And this village had been absolutely wiped out by diseases far before the separatists came. You have to remember that the Native Americans did not have the exact same immunity systems that the Europeans did. Not that they understood the science of this anyway, but the the introduction of disease into the North American continent among the Native American tribes has uh, historically been one of the greatest tragedies of all time. And some estimates are that it killed within about 10 or 20 years, 90% of the North American Native American population. 
Wow, that's that's a huge number. All right. So uh, we can see this uh, native uh, village. Now this one uh, is from 1605, so when it was uh, perhaps a bit more uh, populated, populated we could yes. say. Okay, so let's go on to our next question. Here we go. The Native American village at Plymouth was called Patuxet, Wessagusset, Mashpee, or Poconoket. I like all uh, the way all of those sound. <laughs> they're, they're, fun, they're fun to say. Now we got five answers in so far. Oh, it looks like we've got six. Oh, okay, that was kind of across the board, but uh, two people got it right. Yes, they did. Uh, the, the correct answer is uh, Patuxet. All right, let's see uh, who got that correct. Oh, nice, nice. Okay, so History, Josh, and Didi Want Chicken got uh, some more points there. Caver is still in the lead. So uh, we'll learn a little bit more about this, um, the P Patuxet. Patuxet, yes. Yeah. So this, this village, of course, was uh, a Native American village. And you can see in this photograph here a reproduction of the type of uh, structure that was very common in this area of what became called new, what came to be called New England, uh, using mostly bark, willow, natural materials, of course, and more than one family unit would usually live within each one of these structures. And uh, Patuxet, of course, gives its name to the to the area around where it originally was. All right, let's go to our next question. Here we go. This Native American tribe was the first to interact with separatists in Plymouth. Was it the Mohican, the Nipmuc, the Pawtucket, or the Wampanoag? Again, all fun things to say. They really are. <laughs> all right, we got five answers in. 13 seconds left. Okay, we got six answers. Oh, nice. Most of you right. got that correct. Right. Excellent. All right, the let's. The correct answer is the Wampanoag. So let's take a look at our scoreboard. Oh, nice. Dee Dee Want Chicken has the highest answer streak of three so far, but Caver is still in the lead, followed by History Josh. Nipping at his heels. <laughs> yes, yes. So um, let's see. I believe we were going to learn a little bit more mm -hmm. about... Ah, yeah, so this is a depiction of a Wampanoag warrior. Glenn, could you tell us a little bit more about this culture? I can tell you a little bit more. This is, as we say in the history world, not my area of expertise, but the Wampanoag were a uh, uh, somewhat lesser tribe within this larger area and the Wampanoag uh, wanted to be the first to introduce themselves to the separatists and the separatists of course were not totally aware of the political machina machinations of the different tribes but but the separatists also knew they were going to have to have very good relations with Native Americans if their colony was going to survive they could not first of all, be involved in violence and warfare with these Native American tribes, but they also knew that they were going to need their help making it at least through these first two or three years. So the Wampanoag being the, the geographically closest to the separatists were of course the ones that they first established relations with and they continue to have relations with them more prominently than with other tribes. Ah, and uh, Peter and Isaac in our Zoom chat say uh, that the Wampanoag are still here today. So um, if you have a chance, maybe uh, check out. I'm sure there are some great like resources online oh, for their culture sure, today yes. and, and uh, during the time we're speaking about. All right, let's go back to our game and go on to our next question. Here we go. True or false? The separatists were the first Europeans to interact with the Wampanoag. All right, this is a 20 second answer. So we've already got five up, now we've got six. Let's see, were they the very first? Only a few seconds left to make, <laughs> make your answer. And, ah, everybody oh, got that correct. Great did. job, great job. All right, so uh, let's see, <laughs> I know everybody got that correct, but let's see how fast everyone was because you do get extra points if you're quicker. Ah, nice, so DD want chickens has a, a streak of four correct answers in a row. Excellent, but Caver still in the lead uh, by a fair amount as well, but History Josh is in second so far. Coming up. Yeah, yeah. All right, <clears throat> let's go on to learn a little bit more about um, who they interacted with before these uh, separatists. Right, so the Wampanoag had interacted with um, other Europeans, especially English 
uh, colonists and to a lesser extent the Dutch before 1620. Again, trade had been going on in these areas in interaction with the different tribes and Europeans for a good while before this, a, a few decades at least. But the Wampanoag, as I said, they were some of the, the less powerful tribes in the area. And as a result, they were hoping to garner some support from the separatists. Uh, being, ha having interacted with other Europeans, they were hoping that this new group of Europeans might be able to trade different things with them, perhaps even some weapons to increase their stature among other Native American tribes. Oh, all right, all right. Okay, let's go to our next question. Here we go. This Wampanoag chief sought to create an alliance with the separatists. Was it Massasoit, Metacom, Hobomok, or Squanto? All right, so we already got five answers in. I, I bet a fair amount of you knew this one already. Let's see, we got six. I think we're just waiting on one more. Got some, I got about 10 seconds left. Again, some pretty cool names. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and some that are probably familiar to you. Right. Ah, very good, very good. And most folks got that one right. It's Massasoit. All right, let's see who's in the lead now. Ooh, Caver is back with an answer streak of three, still in the lead, followed by History Josh. <laughs> Great job. All right, so let's learn a little bit more about uh, Massasoit. Yes, yeah, so Massasoit, again, having interacted with other Europeans also realized that their position amongst Native American tribes in the area was perhaps in danger and they wanted to increase their stature, increase their tribal power. He wanted this alliance with the separatists. The separatists come with some, some things. They come with perhaps some, some trade possibilities, but they also can provide weapons and fighters to increase the ability of the Wampanoag to have a little bit of, a, of an advantage over their neighboring tribes. Remember folks, everybody's human here and everybody is looking for an angle and Massasoit is no exception. He becomes one of the more uh, nuanced negotiators of this region, especially when the separatists have arrived and this new colony of Plymouth looks like it's going to stick. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go on. This Patuxet man acted as translator between Massasoit and separatist leaders. Was it Anawan, Hobomok, Squanto, or Metacomet? Oh, this was, <laughs> we got some answers in there really quick. <laughs> All right, but I think we're waiting on one more. Ah, ev almost, almost, almost everybody almost, got that right. <laughs> right, yeah, of course the correct answer is Squanto. Yes. All right, let's see our scoreboard now. Uh-oh, History Josh has taken the lead from Caver. Oh, no. <laughs> Good job, History Josh. And DD Want Chicken has an answer streak of six correct answers in a row. Great job. Excellent, excellent. Like, again, it's, it's still anyone's game. That's right. <laughs> All right, let's learn a little bit more about Squanto or uh, Tisquantum. Yeah, so Squanto or Tisquantum was a, um, in some ways, he's come down to us historically as either a ne'er-do-well or a very, very good person, but he was absolutely crucial. It shows the importance of these people who are able to communicate with different languages and can have a foot in each culture, and that was Squanto. Uh, so very often, I know when I was a, a little kid and we were studying about the pilgrims and Thanksgiving, Squanto was this fellow who came along and supposedly was the great savior of the pilgrims. He taught them how um, to do different things. He was able to interact and create the ability to communicate with these different tribes. And, and Massasoit was very, very interested in maintaining Squanto's uh, exclusive interaction between he and the separatists. And that makes Squanto a very powerful person until he tries to double-cross Massasoit, and that's a story for another day. <laughs> yes, become a member, and maybe <laughs> you can hear a little <laughs> bit more about that in our programs. <laughs> All right, let's go on to our next question, and let me make sure we get that on the screen for everyone. There we go. All right. True or false, Squanto taught the separatist how to grow native crops. All right, we already got, we got quick answers in there. We got five answers so far, six. Waiting on one more. Ah, excellent, excellent. Everybody had a, a, either a good guess or already knew that. Excellent. So let's see our scoreboard. 
Will it change? Ah, okay, history. Josh is still in the lead. Oh, good job. DD Want Chicken has the highest answer streak of seven. That is excellent. Great job all around. Absolutely. All right, let's learn a little bit more about um, the growing of cr native crops. Of native crops, yes. You have to remember that um, in this time period, there are a lot of uh, new world products that simply were not in the old world. Corn, squash and pumpkins, uh, certain types of beans, and so Squanto, again, this, this sort of goes back to what I at least learned in elementary school. There's all these pictures of Squanto uh, coming to the, the pilgrims, showing them how to plant these different crops, putting a fish in the ground with each seed uh, of, of corn and, and squash and, and beans. The three sisters, this was called, the, the corn would grow tall and its leaves would go out, providing shade for the squash and pumpkins underneath. And then the beans, the, the, the vines of the beans could coil up the stalk of the corn, and they all were very, very complimentary. And this is the sort of thing that Squanto and other Native Americans were able to share with the separatists, thereby ensuring a sustainable food supply, which is, which is pretty important if you're wanting to make a permanent colony. Now, as I understand it, they brought crops with them. They just were not suitable for this land. Yeah. Uh, do you happen to know what they would have brought along with them? Um, you know, I don't know exactly what they brought with them. They were probably bringing different types of wheat, different uh. kinds of um, uh, perhaps tubers and, and vegetables they would be trying to grow in England. And the, not so much the, um, the, the separatists themselves, but other folks had brought not just crops for food, but crops to grow and sell for cash, just, just tobacco. Mm. But this, but the environment of the, of the Northeast also does not lend itself to a lot of these crops. And as you say, they have to fall back and depend upon native plants uh, that are indigenous to the area and have a proven track record of being able to be fruitful. All right, let's go on to our next question. Here we go. The celebratory dinner between the separatist and the Wampanoag lasted how many days? One day, three days, two days, or four days? All right. Ooh. Oh, nice. Nice. Most of you knew that. It is indeed right. three days. Let's see. Uh, let's see what our scoreboard's like. Uh oh, uh, Caver is coming after you, history, Josh. <laughs> but uh, DD wants uh, DD want chicken has the highest answer streak of eight. That is excellent, and I also see that uh, Peter and Bob are getting some good points too. So excellent job all around. All right, let's learn a little bit more from Glenn about this uh, f this feast. Right. So you know, feast feast is a, is a relative term. A lot of the traditions we have today. Uh, especially those Norman Rockwell paintings show just a table covered with every type of food you can imagine, several different types of meats, um, a feast for people who uh, don't usually have that much consumption and, and uh, dietary, um, what's the word I'm looking for, diversity. Uh, plus, they haven't been able to grow a lot of things, so a lot of the things that are brought to this celebration are brought by the Native Americans, which of course is the uh, the, the native crops we were talking about. And the three days, it's not like they were just sitting there constantly eating for three days. A lot of these foods take time to prepare. You can see them with a deer here. You can't just exactly take a deer down with a bow and arrow and then be eating it in a couple of hours. A lot of this takes preparatory time, uh, getting the fires going, getting the, the baking and all that sort of thing done. So, But the fact that it was three days shows that it is something that was worth celebrating uh, not just the the idea of having enough to eat but this sort of a crystallization of the relationship between the separatists and the wampanoag it was ceremonial as well as practical excellent all right let's go on to our next question here we go true or false turkey is not native to the americas and therefore would not have been eaten by the separatists and natives all right. Oh, we're getting some quick answers now. Five answers in there. Six now. They're really gobbling these questions down. <laughs> that is indeed false. So uh, let's see who, who got that right, though. Let's go to our scoreboard. Ooh, Matt's coming up in the ranks. Yeah, uh, yeah. History Josh is keeping his place at first, uh, but Caver is making a comeback with three answers in a row. Excellent, excellent. All right, let's learn a little bit more about the turkey. 
Yeah, so the turkey is native to the North American continent um, and was known to provide <laughs> a lot of meat for being able to just bring one of them down. And it's interesting because it is native to the North American continent, one of our founding fathers, Benjamin Franklin, thought that when it was time to choose a symbol for the new United States, everyone else seems to have wanted the eagle that we've come to know, and which was obviously adopted. But Benjamin Franklin said, why don't we choose something native to where the United States is? Let it be the turkey. So I'm not sure how the, the great seal of the United States would have looked with a turkey with an olive branch clutched in one <laughs> and, and arrows clutched in the other, <laughs> something we won't have to worry about. But it's, it's interesting to contemplate. Yeah, in another dimension, <laughs> we have a, a fierce turkey. All right, excellent, excellent. Let's go on to our next question. Beginning in this year, the last Thursday of November was proclaimed as a day of Thanksgiving. Was it in 1776, 1863, 1910, or 1918? Oh, we got four answers so far. It seems like this might be a little little trickier, perhaps. You can see what happened to our old turkey there in that photograph. That's right. <laughs> All right, we got six answers. Oh, oh, nice. Actually, most of you got that. Great job. Great job. All right, so let's see uh, what our scoreboard looks like. Ooh, nice history, Josh. Still in the lead, following, uh, followed by Caver and history. Josh has the wow, the highest answer streak of nine. That is excellent. Great job. Yes. Yeah, so, 1863 during the American Civil War. This is a time when unimaginable sorrow, loss, bloodshed is occurring within the United States between it and the seceded states of the Confederacy, and so. Since things had gone better than in 1863 than they had the previous two years for the Union, Abraham Lincoln decides to declare a day of thanksgiving for the fact that the war seems to be going the Union's way, finally. And so this is the first officially proclaimed day of giving thanks within the United States. Now, it was very common for different uh, denominations, local and, and national, to, to ask for days of thanks, but this is the first one that was sort of mandated by the secular government. Now, I imagine perhaps that was not as celebrated in the South, or do we know? <laughs> yeah, I, I, not, at, not at first it wasn't. <laughs> right. It, it comes to be a, a thing later on in the South. Yeah, yeah. And then we develop the ability to make the food better, but that's just one man's opinion. <laughs> now, what would they have? What would these soldiers that are pictured here have been eating on this Thanksgiving day? <laughs> uh, perhaps just slightly better food. Remember, this is this is in November. This is the time the crops are actually going to be brought in, so there is going to be somewhat of an abundance and availability uh, of different foods. Uh, they may actually have some, some fresh meat rather than salt pork or salt beef. They may actually have some, some fairly fresh vegetables, some fairly fresh baked bread for a day such as this. But it, like, like so many other days uh, within the U.S. military, the U.S. Army, the U.S. military tries to get these special meals out to the troops on Thanksgiving. But the day after, it just goes right back to the, to the same old crud that they usually get. And if you would like to see Glenn uh, cook and eat some of that usual crud, we have a program <laughs> on right. Civil War Camp Food if you become a digital member. <laughs> All right, let's get back to our game. So our next question is... This president changed the date for Thanksgiving to the third week of November to encourage more holiday shopping. Was it Herbert Hoover, Woodrow Wilson, Calvin Coolidge, or Franklin D. Roosevelt? All right, we got five answers in so far. Oh, six. All right, a little bit more time. And uh, I know this, this, all of these presidents are basically within the same era, <laughs> uh, more or less of each other, so it might be a little tough. Oh, uh, we have Getting one more question. All right. Oh, most of you got it. It was indeed FDR. So let's see who is on our scoreboard now. Ah, History Josh still in the lead. Ooh, nice. Ten correct answers in a row, followed by Caver. Still doing great. And I, I see Matt is on the board again. Excellent, excellent. All right, let's learn a little bit more about uh, why this happened. <laughs> right, so this was, um, I want to say this was 1941. Uh, and, and again, 
FDR decides to break with the tradition and push the day of Thanksgiving to a different weekend so that uh, and he's getting pressure from a lot of the, the manufacturers uh, and, the, and the stores so that they can get an extra day of or extra weeks worth of shopping for the holiday seasons, kind of push it closer to Christmas. This created a huge kerfuffle. And the picture that was shown just uh, during the question is from the movie Holiday Inn. And there's a, there's a funny little segment in Holiday Inn that most of us don't get today. But it would have made perfect sense to everyone in America. It's where the, the turkey is hopping back and forth between the two Thursdays and then ends up going like this because even though FDR declared a different day for Thanksgiving, a lot of people and a lot of businesses ignored it and just had it on the regular third uh, Thursday of, of, the, of the month of November. So it was a very confusing year. That did not happen again. Oh, but two Thanksgivings. I mean, what if you could just have it on the, like the third Thursday and the fourth? I mean, that that seems you could have the leftovers from the third week on the fourth. We week. just got out of the depression, Linda. Who can uh, afford that many turkeys? You're right. <laughs> wah, wah, wah. All right, let's get back to our game. Okay, so our next question is: The first Macy's Thanksgiving parade took place in this year. Is it 1901, 1924, 1913? Are 1935. Are you a fan of watching the Macy's Day Parade? When I was younger, I used to be. It was a big deal, it yeah. Was, it, was, it was kind of the thing to do that morning yeah. while my, my poor mom and grandmother were in the kitchen <laughs> uh, slaving away trying to get that meal ready. Right, yeah. Um, <laughs> All right, we got six answers this, in yeah, so this far. Is, this is a tough one. Ooh, okay, most of you got it. It was indeed 1924. So let's see who's in the on, on our scoreboard. <gasps> uh oh! Ooh, what a turn of events! Caver is now in the lead. Uh oh, history, Josh. But and Peter has the highest answer streak of seven. Great job, Peter! Oh my goodness, uh, what a titillating game oh, we have! <laughs> All right, let's go on to learn a little bit more about uh, the Macy's Day Parade. So yeah, Macy's, Macy's of course is a, is a big store. It, it eventually became a chain, but this was the big uh, store in New York, and it eventually sponsor this parade as a way to encourage shoppers to come in and start their Christmas day, Christmas shopping, bring a lot of people out onto the streets, and it just happened to be right there in front of Macy's. And so, of course, as it is today, there's a lot of popular things, um, pop culture things. You see a, a, a big balloon of Mickey Mouse here, and then there's always Santa at the very end of the Macy's Day Parade, and it has become a holiday tradition televised all over the U.S., and um, lots of people still go to it. And sometimes the high school bands, my high school band actually got to play in it one year. I was not in the band that year, but, but it did get to play in that coveted Macy's Day Parade. Oh, that's really cool. Nice. All right, let's go on to our next question. This president was the first to unofficially pardon a turkey. Was it Franklin D. Roosevelt, George Herbert Walker Bush, Abraham Lincoln, or Harry S. Truman? All right, let's see. We got four. Okay. Uh, oh, it's six answers now. Got a few seconds left. Okay. Uh, it, it looks like we stumped some of you, but it was indeed Abraham Lincoln. Now, <laughs> emphasis on the unofficial. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So let's see who's in uh, the ranks now. Oh, 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 that's right. This was our last question. Oh, so we won't know who got Ooh, it. Until the end. So we're going to get some context from Glenn first. Yeah, so, so Tad, Lincoln and, and um, Mary Todd's son, um, over the course of the year had gotten this turkey that was supposed to be their Thanksgiving turkey that, was, that would wander around uh, the grounds of the, of the White House. Uh, Tad would bring it in, and Tad got quite attached to this thing almost as a pet. And so when it actually came time, um, to carve this turkey up and have it for a meal. Tad appealed to the highest power in the land to make sure that this turkey would not go under the knife. And Abraham Lincoln, being a uh, munificent leader of the free world, decided to pardon this turkey. Tad's friend got to hang out with him for a few more years. And I suppose they simply had cold ham sandwiches that night instead. Oh, that's a really sweet story. <laughs> a very sweet Thanksgiving story. All right, my friends, now we are going to see our scoreboard. So, drum roll. Here we go. Oh, yes. And also, 
We are thankful for you. So thank you so much (laughs) for joining us tonight. Um, So now let's see who our winners are. Well, our winner is. So in third place, we have (gasps) DD Want Chicken. Woohoo! In second place, (gasps) Caver. So that must mean. (gasps) History Josh. Indeed, you have won. Now, History Josh, uh, you have. I believe that you're already a digital member. Uh, if it's the History Josh I'm thinking yeah, of. Yeah, surely yes. you are. So History Josh, you have won a, a digital membership uh, to gift. Um, you are welcome to gift that to a, a friend or family member. Uh, just please email me, uh, Libba at N-E-G-A-H-C dot O-R-G. I'm going to put that in our Zoom chat so you have my email. And uh, and thank you all so much. Uh, I'm going to take it back to Glenn to... Uh, to close us out, but uh, Glenn, uh, what what are you thankful for this year? Oh my goodness. Um, this year I am thankful for the usual things, my family, um, the opportunity to be where I'm at with great staff like Libba and be in a place where I can just talk about history all day long with people like you that actually want to talk about history with us. That is a really cool thing. And I'm thankful all the year around, not just on the third or fourth Thursday of November. I I absolutely second that. We are so thankful for all of our members, uh, everyone who is watching or is going to watch later. We hope you have a wonderful Thanksgiving. And of course, uh, programs like this are free for our members. So again, if you want to become a digital member or a a member, if you're local, there are lots of great programs that we have. Um, And be sure to check out our upcoming events as well. We've got an excellent homeschool day about the Civil mm-hmm. War, and then we have our probably our biggest family day of the year. Uh, our Christmas family day is on December 18th from 1 to 4, and I hear Santa Claus is going to be there for These, free pictures. The Santa Claus? The, here the Santa History Claus Center? here at the History Center. Uh, it's going to be an Appalachian Christmas. So uh, that's going to be a lot of fun. Learn about Appalachian culture and history and Christmas traditions during that. Thank you all so much. Uh, we love playing this trivia game with you. And again, do become a member of the Northeast Georgia History Center. Um, I'm going to show you how right here at our ending screen. 